Welcome to Bethlehem Church Online. I'm Pastor Matt. I'm so excited that you decided to join us for worship today. I hope the singing and preaching of God's Word is uplifting and it gives you just what you need. I'm not sure where you are in your relationship or your walk with the Lord, uh, but I want today to be a blessing. I want you to have an encounter with the Holy Spirit. And so we pray that today is encouraging and that it's just what you need. If it's your first time, make sure to click the link in the post and fill out that form. We have a free gift for you following today's service. Thank you so much for joining us and enjoy the service. Anyways, I, uh, I'm really excited though about what God is doing in our church, but also what God is doing through our church. Uh, the people that are coming, the people that are reaching, we're going to have baptism this morning. This is really what it's all about, is us getting to know God and letting God change our lives. And one of the unique things that God has been able to do in, you know, through preaching and teaching in my life is to give me an opportunity to show you all what God, how God works in my life and then have you all hear about that and experience that. I want you guys to experience God the way that that, that I have, you know, the things that he's changed in my life. One of the cool things, though, is like I've never really done expository preaching where we just follow, you know, book by book by book. Like I always grew up in topical preaching because, you know, what was that? Whatever was going on in the church, that's what the preacher preached on, right? So um, we don't do that here. Uh, we're going book by book. So it's been a unique challenge for me this week to kind of look at the next chapter. So we're going to be in John chapter 4 this morning. And it's really, really cool to see, like, I've been, I've been saved a long time. I've been going to churches 40 plus years on my own, you know, without, without my mom pushing me. So God has really, you know, exposed me to a lot of teaching, a lot of preaching, and some things that I learned about this. I've never done a contrast and comparison about what God did in the previous chapter, in John chapter 3 to John chapter 4. I was like, oh, those are two separate scenarios. So as we got in it this week, I was like, man, God is really taking, and, and John does a really good job at putting this together, is he's showing what happened with, the, um, with Nicodemus, and he's going to compare that to what happens to the woman at the well, a Samaritan woman. And so as we go through this, I'm going to give you a little bit of history, a little bit of background, and we're going to get into it, and we're going to beat the Methodist to lunch, so we're going to be good. It's all good. You guys don't want to beat the Methodist to lunch? I'll preach for two hours. <laughs> Just kidding. I don't know if I could do that after this morning. Man, I, I tell you, if you've never had a chance to get up and, like, give everything you've got for two separate services for an hour apiece, it's a lot. So uh, you guys need to pat Matt on the back. <clears throat> All right, we're going to be in John chapter 4. So we're going to go through some verses here. Uh, the title of the message is The Woman at the Well, A Contrast in Encounters with Jesus. And I'm going to tell you, we're going to bring you to some different encounters that they had. And I want you guys to be able to think about some encounters that you have. We're going to read in verse, uh, verse 1 says, Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard he was making and baptizing more disciples than John, though Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were. He left Judea and went again to Galilee. He had to travel through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sukkar, near the property that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, worn out from his journey, sat down at the well. It was about noon. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Give me a drink, Jesus said to her, because his disciples had gone into town to buy food. How is it that you, a Jew, ask me or ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? She asked him, the Jews, did not, the Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God and who was saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. Sir, said the woman, you do not even have a bucket and the well is deep. So where do you get this living water? You aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? And, she, man, she's opening up a lot right there. So she's taking, she's bringing father Jacob into this. So, man, we're going to see how that turns out. He gave us the well. Uh, he gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and livestock. 
Jesus said, everyone who drinks from this water will thirst, uh, will get thirsty again. But whosoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again. In fact, the water I will give him will become a well of water springing up in him for eternal life. Sir, the woman said to him, give me this water so that I don't get thirsty and come here to draw water. Jesus said in verse 16, Go call your husband, he told her, and come back here. I don't have a husband, she answered. You have correctly said, I don't have a husband, Jesus said. For you have had five husbands, and the man that you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Sir, the woman replied, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews say that The place to worship is in Jerusalem. And Jesus told her, Believe me, woman, an hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know because salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Somebody say amen. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship must or worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to Him, I know that the Messiah is coming who is called the Christ. And here's the whole thing. When He comes, He will explain everything to us. And Jesus told her, I, the one speaking to you, am He. We're going to see a comparison uh, this morning about how Jesus brings us to encounters. We're going to see that Nicodemus had an encounter with Jesus and he tried to have it on his own terms. And we're going to see that Jesus came across this woman and he is going to show her some things in the encounter. And then we're going to see their responses. So I wanted to... um, I wanted to take you through some background. Uh, The first thing I want to do is I kind of wanted to show you. So Jesus is leaving Judea uh, down near Jerusalem, and he's going to head north. And he's going to, do we have the map? We want to pull the map up a little bit. So he's going to make this trip up to Galilee, and the trip is going to be about 70 miles long. And so... I'm a big geography guy in the Bible. Uh, it's really cool to see a lot of different things. Uh, when you see Babylon in the Bible, I've actually been to Babylon. So geography means a lot to me. So when I studied this out, I'm like, why would he go through this route? Well, it, it says that it's the most direct route. It's about 70 miles. And I don't know about you, but I mean, do you guys think that you can make a 70-mile journey in two and a half days? How many of you think you could? Come on, let's see it. Nobody? All right, so uh, Jesus, Jesus has got it going on, right? So here we go. So Jesus is going to start right here, and he's going to make this journey up through uh, Samaria right here. And we're going to talk a little bit about how they formed Samaria. And then he's going to be all the way up here to Galilee. Now, what you can't see on this map is this is a mountain range. So this is the most direct route it would have been taken through the highest points of the mountain not having to go down in elevation. This route right here is is the second most common route traveled by Jews because it avoided Samaria altogether. They would go on the east side of the Jordan River, and they they would basically transit at the base of a mountain. This is a mountain range too, right here. So you're going down in elevation, walking along the river, and then you're traveling back up in elevation. It's about 10 extra miles and it would have added a significant amount of travel time onto the trip. I don't know that the, the terrain was as important. I just wanted you to kind of have a visual picture of what the disciples are doing, what Jesus is doing when it comes to this. So they're going to cut right through Samaria. Well, what is Samaria, and how did Samaria come about? I think it's pretty critical to understand the relationship between this group of people, who they were, their background, And why did they have such a big beef with the Jews? So we go all the way back to 10th century B.C. Uh, We see that King Solomon had been marrying 
uh, foreign wives. And because of that, God is going to judge him. He's going to come online and tell him, listen, I'm going to split your kingdom, but I'm not going to do it during your time. So King Solomon has a son, Rehoboam, and it ends up after uh, King Solomon is gone that Rehoboam is going to be king, but the kingdom is split. It's split into a north and a south. And King Rehoboam is going to be one of the kings, and it's going to be uh, a, a few centuries later, in the 700s, the Assyrians are going to come on into the scene, and they're going to basically take over the north. They're going to conquer the northern kingdom. And because of that, they're going to take away a lot of the Jewish people. They're going to take them as prisoners uh, and slaves and take them back out of the picture. But a lot of them stayed. And when that happened, the Assyrians came in and they started to intermarry between the Assyrians and the Jews. Well, this was forbidden in the Jewish custom at the time. And so what we're going to see is that already the Jews who are not in the area, who are in the southern kingdom, they're going to look at them as kind of a half-breed, that they're half Jewish, half uh, Assyrian. And so that's where the Samaritan name comes from. And so when you see Samaria, it's an area that is occupied by people who are half Jewish and half Assyrian. So the Jewish people don't, don't really care for them at all. But an interesting point is, the Assyrians don't care for the Jews either. I always kind of thought it was like the Jews just, I don't know, they just looked down on them. They were, you know, kind of snooty about it and it was like, ah, oh, Samaritans, blah, blah, blah. But what we do see is uh, later on in 500 BC, the 500s, uh, the southern kingdom of Judah fell to the Babylonian Empire and they destroyed Jerusalem. They destroyed the walls, they destroyed the temple. Well, the temple was where a lot of the prophecies come, come from the temple is where it's going to be the base of operations for a lot of the Jews, uh, and they believe that's where the Messiah is going to come out of. Interestingly enough, the Samaritans don't believe that. They only follow the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. And so not only do they, did they stray away from traditional Jewish customs, they're going to be a little bit more stringent, and they think that the Messiah is going to come from the line of Moses. It is not necessarily going to come from the lineage that's from the southern kingdom. So now they're at battle with religion. So it's not just culture that they're dealing with. They're, they're at battle with religion and where the Messiah is going to come from. The Samaritans establish a temple on Mount uh, Gerizim, and they claim that uh, Moses was going to be uh, the lineage was going to come through them. But they saw themselves as the true descendants of Israel and the preservers of true religion. So we got one side that thinks they're correct and the other side thinks they're correct. Do we see that in churches today? Really? We can't all just get along? No? All right. We're about to divide this. We're going to divide this church today. People are going to take a stand and we're going to see where everyone is. All right? You guys ready for this? So the Persian Empire comes in. And they basically tell Nehemiah who, uh, that he can rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. So now we have something going on. They're going to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. Well, Samaritans didn't like this. So they opposed and they actually tried to sabotage the building of the temple in Jerusalem. So now the Jews really hate the Samaritans. The Samaritans really hate the Jews. And I got to thinking, man. What's a good example of that nowadays? And I was like, man, the, the Jets and the Sharks from the West Side Story? You guys familiar with that? Okay, about half of you? Well, that won't do, so we can't do that. We can't do Jets and Sharks. You know, we can do a little musical. You guys want to see me perform music? No, you want me to sing? All right, $500 right in the back black box, and I'll sing next week. Don't you dare drop $500 back there. He's like, I got him. <laughs> So now we have them basically opposing each other. And I tried to think of a good you know, comp, you know, comparison. And I got to think, oh, look, it's like the Ravens and the Steelers. That's the, you guys all familiar with that, right? Well, 
so now we got this team, this comparison that we have. Is we have Jews and we have the Samaritans. So we're going to see Nicodemus is what? Do you guys want Nicodemus to be Team Raven or Team Steeler? Steelers. So you want the Jews to be Steelers? Yeah. All right. All right. We'll see. We'll see how that turns out. So we got the Ravens are the Sumerians. And so that's, what, that's the way we're going to work this today. All right. Uh, when we look at this, uh, it's, it's a pretty big riff, and, and it, it does mean a lot because there's, there's a lot of cultural pressure that was put on people in that area that still happens a lot today, but that we don't experience. But it's going to be important to you, and I'm going to tell you. The whole theme for this today is going to be don't be Nicodemus, all right? Don't be a Nicodemus, but we'll see. Some of us are going to be Nicodemuses. I don't know what the plural of Nicodemus is. Nicodemus is, 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 all right. So a few points, and uh, we'll, we'll wrap this up. So the first point, first comparison that we see uh, that John makes is Nicodemus came to Jesus in the dark, and the woman at the well met Jesus in the light. Uh, verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 2 tells us, this man came to him at night. And chapter 4, verse 6, tells us that Jacob, uh, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, worn out from his journey, sat down at the well, and it was about noon. So already we have kind of a spiritual comparison. We see that Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. There was a difference, too, that, G, that Nicodemus actually came to Jesus. So we see that Nicodemus is drawn to Jesus. The woman at the well didn't have any, any say in the matter. But we see that there is already a comparison between Nicodemus coming at night and Jesus meeting this woman in the daylight. Well, we all know that light is, deals with purity and that nothing can uh, be hidden in light. Um, John chapter 1, verse 9 describes Jesus as the true light, which gives light to everyone. When we think of the darkness, we think of sin. That's typically how we relate that. And we're going to see that Nicodemus is basically holding on to his religious construct. Even though he comes to Jesus, even though he's drawn to Jesus, we're going to see that Nicodemus wants to meet Jesus on his terms. How often do you and I actually want to come and encounter Jesus, but we want to encounter Jesus on our own terms? And we hold on to our sin, and we try to come into church, and we try to have that right encounter, that right relationship with Jesus, but we want to do it on our own terms. When we leave here, we're not changed. We want to hold on to that sin. We want to hold on to those things that we find so pleasurable in our own lives. Well, Nicodemus has this religious construct that he doesn't want to get rid of. He's high and mighty. He's Jewish. He's, he has wealth. Those things he's not willing to risk when he comes to meet Jesus. So how are we any different sometimes when we bring our sin, we meet Jesus in the dark instead of meeting him in the light. Well, we see the, the opposite happens with her is she comes in, she's meeting Jesus in the light. Everything is out in the open, so she has an opportunity. There's going to be things in her life that Jesus brings to her, but there's nothing hidden. So, when we encounter Jesus, how are we encountering, encountering him? Are we encountering him in the darkness or in the light? You know, and that's a matter of Jesus. I, and I also like to think that Nicodemus is kind of an example. He comes to Jesus. So after you're saved, a lot of us come to Jesus after we're saved, and we encounter him on a daily basis again and again and again. But we carry our stuff with us. If we're going to hold on to it, we're going to meet him in the dark. Now, the woman is going to experience this in the light. That's a lot how a lot of us experienced him at salvation. When we first encountered him, everything was on the table. Uh, some of us held on to it longer than others, but um, it's, it's going to be something that we can absolutely work through. One key thing that I wanted to point out about Nicodemus that I have written here, so I don't even know where my notes are. So, One key thing is that Nicodemus was drawn to the light, but he was terrified of what it would do. 
He was terrified that he would have to give up those things, that religious... Con- Can you imagine what it would have costed Nicodemus? And we see that Nicodemus, what, what Matt was preaching about, later on, he does certain things for Jesus. He stands up for Jesus against the Sanhedrin, but he wasn't willing to do it at that time. And so we see that there's a difference, there's a comparison that Nicodemus came to Jesus in the dark and the Samaritan woman met him in the light. So don't be a Nicodemus. Meet Jesus in the light. The next thing that we see is Nicodemus was a man and the Samaritan was a woman. So on the one hand, we see Jesus meeting Nicodemus and it would have been totally normal for Nicodemus to meet with a man, a Jewish man who is a rabbi. There's a lot of things that they have in common that culturally it was totally okay for them to meet. And then the opposite end of that is we see Jesus meeting a Samaritan, which Jews didn't typically talk to Samaritans, but he's meeting a woman. He's talking to a woman. So there are social constructs, social walls that we have in society that Jesus has to break down. And we see one of those was a Jewish man just did not talk to a woman alone. It just didn't happen. There's some studying that I was doing, and I thought it was kind of funny. Um, Y'all may not think it's funny, but I got the mic, so whatever. Anyways, the, the, the Jewish leaders at the time, it's so funny, is they would not even talk to their wives in public. You know, this is the, this is the severity of that social construct that Jesus had to break down. And make no mistake about it, it doesn't matter what our social construct is, whether it's man, woman, whether it's uh, lifestyle or, or, you know, whether or not we believe in whatever science, evolution. It doesn't matter. Jesus came to break down all those walls. He came to break down all those constructs because everybody has to begin at the same point. We are all sinners and Christ died for us. Jesus is bringing them to the same level. When you look at the differences that Nicodemus had all this and the Samaritan woman didn't have any of this, it doesn't matter. Jesus is going to put them all on a level playing field. The third comparison that we see is Nicodemus was named and she was not. So his name, obviously, Nicodemus was given, and she is just simply referred to as a woman of Samaria in chapter 4, verse 7. Well, God is not impressed with names. And one of the things that we see here is Nicodemus is named. He's, he has all of his titles. He has all the different things that are going for him. And the woman was not named, but their encounter was completely different. And we're going to get into that here in a little bit. Uh, Romans, uh, <clears throat> sorry, Romans 2.11 says, There is no favoritism with God. God is not impressed by our religious stature, any name that we may have, any works that we do on our own. You see that the woman had nothing, and Nicodemus had everything. So we have to realize is what makes us valuable to Jesus. Well, what makes us valuable to Jesus is individually we are souls, and that all those souls are equal. So the social construct, the names, none of that. Philippians 2.10 says, At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, of those in heaven, of those of earth, and those under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There's only one name in this whole scenario that's going to matter, and that's the name of Jesus. We say it's simply Jesus because that's the only thing If we look at the contrasting comparisons, it doesn't matter if we have a good name. It doesn't matter if if it's pastor, if it's elder, if it's deacon or whatever. It doesn't matter if it's president. Those names, those titles don't matter. It's just simply the name of Jesus. And that's what has to be put at the forefront. It didn't matter that the the woman at the well was not named. We're going to see her encounter was a lot different than Nicodemus's. It only matters that Every one of us at some point need to understand every knee is going to bow 
And every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So in our own lives, the only name that should matter to us is Jesus. We see the next comparison. Nicodemus was a Jew, and she was a Samaritan. Chapter 3, verse 1 says, There was a man from the Pharisees named Nicodemus, ruler of the Jews. So not only was he a Jew, he was a ruler of the Jews, which meant he had a lot. So believe it or not, he had a lot to lose according to the world's standards, but he had a lot to gain according to Jesus' standards, and that's where he missed it. That's where he missed it. When we look at what he had, he had the best of everything. He had, um, I was telling him 9 o'clock, I don't know if you guys have ever seen the clothes that they wear. So I had a chance when I was in Iraq, I was wearing a dish dasha, which is the, the dress that a man wears. Not, ne- not literally a dress, but, you know, the, the clothing that the man wears. And it comes down just a little bit past the knees. It's kind of like a tunic. But I was telling the 9 o'clock service that I think we should have tunic day and all the men should wear tunics. <laughs> so I, I definitely didn't get any laughs during the 9 o'clock service. They didn't like that at all, so... I'm advocating for tunic day. All right, tunic day. But what we do see, though, is that Nicodemus, in his heritage, had a lot. He was Jewish. And and you see that Jesus referred to it. It was Nicodemus had a belief that the line for the Messiah was going to come through their lineage. And he was right. So he was right, he had everything, so where'd he miss it? How did he miss out on that? See, it doesn't necessarily matter if we think that we're right in a certain scenario, or if we have all the right information, or if we have the right upbringing, or I was always raised in church, or I've always been at church. None of that matters, because we see the Samaritan woman didn't have any of that. But she comes to a point in a realization that, She sees who Jesus is. And that's all that matters in these scenarios is that we have that encounter with Jesus, is that we recognize who Jesus is and what we're supposed to do with that. He was part of the right group, whereas she was part of a despised group with wrong beliefs and practices. Something I didn't tell you is in about 200 B.C., uh, we had, they had a Greek, a bunch of Greeks uh, come in and invade, and they made everybody in the area worship Greek gods. If you didn't, you were put to death. The Jews actually refused. The Jews in the southern kingdom refused, and they made it. But the Samaritans put a temple to Zeus on the same mount where they put their temple to Moses. So they're given they're given in. So. Not only do they have wrong beliefs, they have wrong practices. So they were despised. It's likely that the woman feared Jesus because of all the animosity. Do you guys ever get into an elevator with your Ravens jersey on and six Pittsburgh Steelers fans get on? I feel like that's what she felt like. You know what I'm saying? No. You guys really fear Pittsburgh Steelers fans? Listen, man, I went to an Oakland Raider. uh, Not an Oakland Raider. I went to an Oakland A's game and a bunch of Raider fans. I wore a Dodger jersey. And, man, I felt, I felt pretty, pretty unsafe at the time. So I, I can only imagine how you guys feel going to Pittsburgh when your Ravens close. So, hey, listen, if you guys want me to be a Ravens fan with you, I'm a Dolphins fan. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Marlon, it's okay, man. He's right behind you. He knows. He knows. But, listen, I'm willing to give it up for what Kurt don't. Don't, man, don't sell, don't, don't give up on me, brother. I'm willing to give it up for one year if you guys put $5,000 in the black box, all right? I'm going to raise some sort of money today. But what we're going to look at is, so this woman may have even feared Jesus. You know, between the two groups, Nicodemus was viewed, viewed Jesus as something of an equal or contemporary. And I think that that's a big deal that he never transitioned in his belief that Jesus was something more than just a teacher. She started to transition into Jesus was more than just what I thought he was, which was a Jewish man. So we absolutely can look at this. Uh, We can have our upbringing. 
we can throw all these different constructs into here. She had all the religious, uh, she had all the barriers uh, in her life. And Nicodemus had all the opportunity. So we would think that Nicodemus would have been the one who came to the conclusion that who Jesus was. That's not, that's not what happened. Because he held on to his barriers. And we see that the woman at the well started to drop her barriers. Jesus started to overcome those barriers. By the way, Jesus overcame Nicodemus' barriers. It was Nicodemus' choice not to let him go. It was, and many times, all right, if I had a soapbox, I would put it right here and I would stand on it. Many times when we don't experience spiritual victories, it's because we don't let go of what Jesus knows is going on in your life. If I could tell you anything in my spiritual walk, learn from me, is don't hold on. You identify it, bring it to the light, bring it up to God, and get rid of it. Because it's just going to fester. It's going to turn into more issues than you could ever imagine. The more you hold on to stuff, the more, the further away you will be from Jesus. So, all right. Off my soapbox. What's happening? All right. All right. We already went over the tunic day. All right. Good times. Comparison number five. So he was considered righteous, honored, and religiously educated according to the world standards. She was considered a sinner, an outcast, and a religiously ignorant Samaritan. This is what we're going to see through the reading of these next two verses is that it's Jesus who is identifying both of them. Jesus is going to point out to Nicodemus who he is. He's kind of putting it back on Nicodemus. This is who you are. He's putting it to the woman. This is who you are. And make no mistake about it, Jesus at some point in your life is going to tell you this is who you are. It should be a daily occurrence that Jesus tells you this is who you are. This, is, this should be taking accountability, I think, is what we used to call it. Taking stock, being accountable for your sin on a daily basis. So verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 10, the first part of it says, Are you a teacher of Israel? He's putting it back in Nicodemus' court. So he's identifying him as a teacher, as somebody who has a high level of education, as somebody who has a lot of responsibility in the Jewish religious system. And we see in chapter 4, verse 17, uh, <clears throat> I don't have a husband, she answered. You have correctly said, I don't have a husband, Jesus said. For you have had five husbands, and the man you have now is not your husband. So he was a Pharisee. They were known of being very religious, devout, uh, very just, uh, th that's where the word zealot comes from. So it's very zealous, like there's a lot of emphasis put in this. But we also see that uh, he is a ruler. He enjoyed high places in society. But she was uh, by herself at the well which is an important thing to realize here is that women did not travel by themselves back then. They traveled in packs. Um, I don't know, kind of like piranhas. I don't, I don't know. So, I mean, but anyways, maybe not the best analogy, all right? But deal with me. I'm just a hick, so. Um, so the women traveled, it, it did a couple of things. It kept them safe physically, but it also kept them safe morally. So there was no controversy about their, you know, what was happening to them. Now, realize the woman is by herself meeting with Jesus. So this is breaking down a lot of those barriers. She was at the well by herself, which means she was an outcast in her own society because she had five husbands and was with someone who was not her husband. Being an outcast in a society that's already outcast, and now she's meeting with a Jew who thinks... You know, who know who he would have known. Jesus would have known. She's traveling by herself. There's something wrong. She's at the well at noon. Women typically came to the wells in the morning or the evening because it was the coolest part of the day. And that's when they get the water for whatever they needed, whether it was for um, 
for uh, laundry or whatever, or for cooking, what, whatever, to feed the animals. Um, man, women did a lot back then. Man, I know that, man. I said, preach. Someone... Sorry, that's my epiphany for the day. My wife's right. <laughs> so anyways. But we see that she's an outcast. And I don't think that we can diminish the fact that there's a comparison that Nicodemus had everything and she had nothing. That he was a high member of society and she was an outcast. Jesus is still putting them both in their rightful place, that says, and, and we're going to cover that here in a second. He's going to put them in their rightful place. But it also tells me that it doesn't matter to Jesus where we come from. It doesn't matter to Jesus what we've done in the past. All that matters to him is that we come to him and we encounter him. So daily on our relationship with Jesus, are we encountering Jesus? Religious can be, religion can be a hindrance. God wants relationship over religion. It's not just about coming and sitting in these pews. It's not just about coming and supporting the car wash. Please do. I won't be here. You want to come grab my cars, you can have them wash them all. I don't care, including my Mustang. Please don't let me scratch my Mustang. But... It's not about any of that stuff. It's about a personal relationship with Jesus. So where are we at? Are we at a place where we haven't encountered Jesus ever? There may be people in here who say, you know what? I don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. Your encounter is coming. It's right now. It's right today. Jesus wants to have a relationship with you. That's what it's about. It's not about a religious organization. Nicodemus missed the whole point. He could have had a religious organization, but none of that mattered. He wanted that more than he wanted a personal relationship with Jesus. We see that that's what Jesus came in to do. Clearly, the expectation was Nicodemus was going to respond to Jesus, but we see altogether it was completely opposite. The last, last comparison that we're going to have is Nicodemus did not progress in his understanding of who Jesus truly was. She progressed to the point of true change. And before we read the verses, I just want to throw this out there. Think about this is, have we changed in our relationship with Jesus? Because relationships, you know, if you're married in here and you first get married and it's all bubbles and rainbows and unicorns and stuff like that, Right? Um, what's it like 10 years later? Is it, it's deeper. It's better. It's more intense, right? So chapter 3, verse 2 says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come to God. Nicodemus started with the understanding that Jesus was a rabbi, a teacher sent by God. That is where he stayed the entire time. We see that in Nicodemus' conversation with Jesus, it got shorter and shorter and shorter as it went on. Is that the way we develop relationships? We just stop talking to one another? Don't answer that, guys. Don't answer that. All right? That's not the way that this relationship should work. We see that Jesus is reaching out to Nicodemus, and he keeps coming to him as teacher, teacher, teacher. There was no progression in who he, he never realized who Jesus was. Or if he did, he made the decision to walk away from it. Bad decision. Don't be a Nicodemus. We see chapter 4, verse 19 says, Sir, the woman replied, I see that you are a prophet. She started off recognizing him as a Jewish man and then ended up realizing that he was a prophet. And then we ended our verses with him saying, I am the Messiah. By the way, he reveals himself as the Messiah to a Samaritan woman who was a complete outcast. Pretty much tells me everybody needs him then, right? We see both these individuals had a misunderstanding in the beginning, but she overcame hers. Nicodemus, uh, when we read that a couple of weeks ago, Nicodemus couldn't, come, couldn't get his mind past the second birth. She couldn't get her mind past initially 
this living water, but both were about eternal life. Both were about Jesus giving them eternal life. And what we see is Nicodemus stayed there. He left in that condition. But we see that she transitioned, and she's already like, you're a prophet. Like, there's something different about this man. And we're going to find out what it is next week when he preaches about what happens. See, what had happened was she ends up real, she ends up hearing that he is the Messiah. And that's where her encounter takes a turn. So my question to you all is, where are you at in your encounter? Is it something that you're meeting Jesus in the dark? Are you meeting Jesus in the light? Are you holding on to religious constructs? Uh, are there things in your life you just can't get past? Well, those are things that we have. There are things that we can bring into this relationship, but we need to be willing to afford Jesus the opportunity to help us get past them. So where are we at? Are we, are we stalled in our understanding of who Jesus truly is? So we'll wrap it up with this. She is the one who responds correctly to Jesus. Although she was a woman, not a man. Although she was unknown and not named. Although she was an outsider and not an insider. Although she was notor- a notorious sinner and not devout. Although she was an outcast and not honored. Although she was uneducated and not a scholar, she recognized Jesus. Her encounter, she chose to go the extra step in her encounter with Jesus. Don't be a Nicodemus. Don't just leave things unsettled and unanswered. So we're going to have um, whoever's going to play, come on, you guys can come on up. Now, I'll play. You guys want me to play? 500 bucks in the box back there, all right? <laughs> all right, George will play for 500 bucks too, and he'll actually know what he's doing. So there are some key takeaways here that we really want, we, we really want you guys to have uh, when it comes to encounters with, with Jesus. One is don't judge others. Uh, It's not our place to judge others, but to see them as Jesus saw them. Jesus saw Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman in the same light. It didn't matter their their standing in society or in their social life. Luke 6, 37 tells us, Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Jesus brought the barrier-crushing the, the, the way to crush these barriers in our life, he brought that to us is for us, just don't judge. Just take care of yourself, take care of individual responsibilities and understand that everybody needs Jesus. Everybody needs Jesus. Now there are some Pittsburgh Steelers fans I'm sure you don't want to meet Jesus, but they need Jesus too. They need Jesus more than you do. Sorry if there are any Pittsburgh Steelers fans in here. second thing we want to point out is salvation is for everybody. Jesus said, Matthew 9, 13, go and learn, go and learn what this means. I desire repentance, not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus wasn't the least bit concerned about our religious standing and our religious piety. He simply wanted people to come to the saving knowledge of him. And that's something that we should be considered with. If our encounters with Jesus don't push us to go out and to call others in, when we go over to 900 Bullies Quarters Road, we're going to have a lot of space. There's going to be a lot of opportunity to fill that space with people who live in this community, people who need Jesus. But what is our encounters with Jesus pushing us to? It should be that salvation is for all. And then the last point with this will be done. We all encounter Jesus. What we do after that encounter is up to us. We all have that initial encounter with Jesus where we realize who we are. But even after we accept him, what are we doing in our encounters? 
do, how often are we encountering Jesus? Are we meeting with him on a daily basis? Are we just sporadically? Is church the only time we have spent with Jesus? Probably need to increase the, the amount of times we're meeting with Jesus. It's not a judgment. Hopefully this is a helpful message for you guys to just do some reflection in your own life that Jesus wants to meet with you. He wanted to meet with Nicodemus. He wanted to meet with the Samaritan woman at the well. He wants that for us. And if we're not willing to accept him for that encounter, we're never going to experience him the way he intended us to be experienced. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I just want to ask you, where are you at in your encounters with Jesus? Thank you for watching and joining us for our church online. I pray this experience was just what you needed today. If you made a decision for the Lord to follow Christ, or if the Lord did something in your heart that was special today, we would love to hear about it. Post it in the comments, send us a message, and we'll reach out to you. Have a wonderful week, and God bless.